Well, good morning, Valley Family Church. Once again, happy Sunday. Welcome to church. Welcome to those that are watching online. Hey, one more time, could we put our hands together and show our appreciation to our founding pastors, Beth and Jeff. Lovely. Thank you guys for the update. And we also appreciate just some good humor. Uh, I love it. It made me laugh. So, hey, well, I'm excited to jump into God's Word. If you guys have your Bibles with you today, why don't you open those to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That's where we're going to be camping out a little bit. And uh, as Alexa mentioned, we have been uh, sort of in a collection of messages really right through the summer. We started early in June called Summer at Valley. And uh, who's, who's been here for one of the, the, one, one of the weeks, Summer at Valley? Great. Love to see it. Um, it's been a lot of fun, and we've been gathering really around this simple idea. What if one summer could change your life? What if one summer could change your life? What if this summer was about more than just the vacations that we went on, the trips we took, the days at the beach, the house projects we completed, but what if this summer could actually be more defined by the radical things that God does in your life? I believe that it can be. In fact, I believe that it will be as we lean into all he has for us. And uh, over the past few weeks, we've uh, kind of been coming around afresh to help us with this, our vision statement as a church. And been kind of leaning into, as Lex mentioned, really our three key pillars of ministry. Uh, let me remind you of the vision statement uh, for our church. It says this, we see a Jesus-centered church changing the world one person at a time through evangelism, discipleship, and community. And in our first week together, we, we leaned into discipleship. We talked a little bit about this invitation we've been given as those who follow Jesus to apprentice under him, to become his followers, become his students, to learn his ways, to, to, to follow after him, to become more like Jesus. Then just a few weeks ago, Lex shared just a beautiful message all about community and the, the challenge that were given almost from the early church about how they were devoted to each other, about how they invested in relationships and into community and that uh, important quote and, and kind of that, 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 that important thing in the life of our church. And, and today, if I can, I, I want to wrap up kind of this collection within the collection and talk a little bit about evangelism, about evangelism. Can everyone say evangelism? I want to share a message with you uh, that God's put on my heart just to help encourage us uh, around the calling that we've been given, each one of us, to share the hope we found in Jesus with others. I, I want to help reframe, if I can, this big and often intimidating idea of evangelism and encourage us in how we can become everyday evangelists right where we are at. If you're there in your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to kind of lean in here and, uh, and talk a little bit about this. But let's, let's read this scripture together. 2 Corinthians 5, I'll read verse 17 down to 21. It says this, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, everyone say now. All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And has given us the ministry of reconciliation. If you have a hard copy Bible, underline that phrase, the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. And he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Everyone say ambassadors. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. This morning, church, I'd like to preach to you a message that I'm going to call Everyday Evangelists. Everyday Evangelists. You guys ready to jump in? Why don't we first pray and we'll get right into it. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for the opportunity to be in the house, to be with you, to open your word. I, I ask you, Father, as we do so today, that you'd speak to us. I pray, Father, you'd help us to learn, to grow, to be challenged, to encourage us, Father God, in this calling you've given us to help the world know all about Jesus. I thank you that because of our time together, God, that we would leave this place, walk and talk and live in and look in a whole lot more like you. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone who agreed said, amen. Have you ever wondered what causes an idea to spread? Like, what is needed to move an idea or a message from one person 
to another. Well, in 2001, Jonah Peretti, the founder of BuzzFeed, one of the kind of original social media platforms, he learned a pretty interesting lesson about this very thing. You see, in 2001, Jonah, he was just a young college student at MIT. And in one of his classes, he, he was exposed to or learned a little bit about some of Nike's, the uh, shoe companies, kind of sketchy manufacturing processes and, and some of the stuff they were doing that really wasn't up to par. And this upset Jonah, and he, and he wanted to bring light to it. He wanted the, the world to be aware of it. And so he had an idea. He thought it would be creative and even humorous to go on Nike's website. And this was back when Nike had just launched making kind of custom sneakers. You guys remember this? You can go on the website. I think you still can. And you can pick your colors. You can even put words on the shoes and kind of have them customized, ordered, sent to your house. Well, Jonah thought, hey, it would be a good idea if I went on the Nike's website and right on the side of one of their sneakers, I had the words printed sweatshop really large. He thought that'd kind of make a point. Uh, so he went on the website. He tried to do that. And as you can imagine, uh, Nike uh, said, hey, we're not going to allow that. We're not going to do that. So, so Nike emailed Jonah and kind of graciously tried to tell him that they wouldn't be able to make the sneakers for him. And so Jonah then replied to that email, kind of stating his case rather humorously of why he should be allowed to put the word sweatshop on the side of their sneakers. And then Nike replied to Jonah explaining why that's not going to happen. And then they went back and forth and back and forth until Jonah and Nike had just numerous emails arguing their case. Well, as you can imagine, at the end of the day, Nike won. They said, we're not making those shoes. Uh, Jonah, he kind of gave up his quest, but he had a thought. He thought, you know what, maybe I can still at least get the message out a little bit of what's going on. So he forwarded that email thread to some of his close family and friends. And uh, those family and friends, they, they read it, and they thought it was funny. <laughs> they thought it was interesting. And so they forwarded those email threads between Jonah and Nike to some of their family and friends who then forwarded on to their family and friends who forwarded on to their family and friends until millions of people around the world had read the email thread between Jonah and Nike. This is one of the first like early viral kind of social media moments. And, and in this moment, as you can imagine, changed Jonah's life. All the big news channels called Jonah for interviews. They wanted to hear about how this whole thing started. It got a lot of attention, a lot of publicity, and, and it really did bring some exposure to what was taking place with Nike and, and sweatshops and the creation of sneakers. And in the process, Jonah learned something really important. Jonah learned that if you want an idea to spread, that you don't need a big marketing campaign. You don't need to be the president. You, you don't need to be more powerful than Nike. You just need to share it with a friend. And thus, a few years later, BuzzFeed was born. Again, one of the original social media platforms all about relationships, humor, and the sharing of ideas. What causes an idea to spread? Well, it just needs to be shared with a friend. Well, and here's the deal, church, this morning... I'd like to suggest that in a sense, this is exactly what evangelism is all about. Evangelism is simply one friend sharing with another friend this life-changing idea that Jesus has come to offer humanity peace, forgiveness, and salvation. It reminds me of what it says in Romans chapter 10. It says, this is that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? <laughs> and how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? This is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring the good news. How does someone go from not knowing Jesus to knowing him? How does someone move from, from, from being lost to being found? How does someone go from being stuck in their own sin to finding salvation in Christ? Well, it is through one person telling another person about the good news of Jesus. 
And this simply is evangelism. It's the message of Jesus being shared from one friend to another, from one family member to another, from one coworker to another, from, 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 one, from one soccer mom to another, from one preacher on a stage to those sitting in a crowd. It's sharing about the love, the mercy, and the goodness of Jesus. It's passing on the idea that there is salvation found in Christ and in Christ alone. And I think this brings us back to the text we read at the beginning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we learn that as those who follow Jesus, as, as those who have recognized that they're stuck and lost in their own sin, that they need a Savior and have put their, 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 their faith in Christ, they've actually been, the Bible says, reconciled with God. What does that mean? That means for those of us in the room who, who follow Christ, it means at one point we were separated from God. Our creator, we did not have communion with him because of the sin in our life. We were separated, but when we put our faith in the sinless savior, Jesus, reconciliation actually takes place. There's, there's something bigger that happens than just becoming a good person or, or starting, you know, starting a new religion. Reconciliation with our creator takes place. And, and then the Bible says, hey, for those who've been reconciled, we actually have something to do. We have to go help others. <laughs> encounter the same reconciliation that we've experienced. It says we've been given, hear this, the ministry of reconciliation. Now I want you to catch this because this is so, so important. <laughs> that calling, this ministry of reconciliation was not given to those who stand on stages with microphones. It was not given to those who have eloquent words. It, it was not given to those who pray the most, those who worship the most. The ministry of reconciliation was passed on to each and every individual who's experienced reconciliation. That means all of us have a part to play. This calling of reconciliation, of evangelism, of helping the word know Christ is not just the job of a church, nor is it the job of some preacher. It's, the, it's all of our responsibility to step into our place to help others to know him. And in fact, did you catch what the Bible calls us? It said, you are ambassadors. What's an ambassador? An ambassador is a representative of a foreign nation in a faraway country. Isn't that brilliant? God says, hey, if you've been reconciled with Christ, you actually became something. I know you didn't sign up for it. I know you didn't even know you were gonna become it. But you are now on earth an ambassador for my kingdom. We are foreign representatives living in Kalamazoo, Michigan, not representing ideologies or even theologies, but representing a different kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And we have a job and responsibility to help others to know the same one we found. Here at this church, we've been called to evangelism. We've been called to it. I'm gonna make it even more personal. You have been called to evangelism. But here's our challenge. I think often when we, when we talk about this idea of evangelism, um, it's a big word, and, and I think at times we can tend to overcomplicate it. Even when I say the word evangelism, <laughs> I know all of us maybe have a different feeling, different thoughts come into our head, and, and sometimes we can sort of talk ourselves out of it. Like I mentioned, sometimes when we think of evangelism, some of us, we may think of, of people like Billy Graham, Maybe of Reinhard Bonnke, we, we, we think of large stadiums, big crusades of anointed preachers and speakers calling thousands to come to salvation in Jesus. And wow, that's a beautiful thing. I think sometimes when we put that image in our head, when we think of evangelism, we can just sort of count ourselves out of it. <laughs> yeah, evangelism is great. That's, that's something like Billy Graham does. But that's not something that, that I do. Evangelism is awesome, but it's not for me. I think others of us, maybe we, we think of evangelism and we think of kind of like the angry guy on the street corner holding a megaphone, yelling at everybody, telling them they're going to hell and they need to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand and we see this image. I think for all of us, it, it's, it, we're, we're repelled from that. If that's evangelism, then I want nothing to do with that. And maybe even others of us, we, we think of more kind of like old school door-to-door -door witnessing taking a gospel track and knocking on a stranger's door and presenting the gospel, walking through the Romans road. It's almost like a, a salesman for Christ. And, and while I think that has its place in certain times and spaces, I think for a lot of us, we, we tried that in college. 
But if that's evangelism, it just felt awkward and inauthentic and like something that I, I don't want to keep doing that. And I think for many of us, we hear about evangelism and we automatically feel incapable. We feel uncomfortable. We feel intimidated. But today, I just wonder, church, what if we could reframe and, and even reimagine what evangelism looks like? What if evangelism wasn't awkward? It wasn't hard. It wasn't just for super Christians. But what if evangelism could actually be more natural, more honest, more everyday? Because here's the deal, and today I want us to get this. The message of Jesus is something that needs to be heard. But sharing it with those in our world was never meant to be hard. I want to say it again. The message of Jesus it is something that needs to be heard. But sharing it with those in our world, it was never meant to be hard because we were never meant to do it alone. Do you remember what it says in Acts chapter one? Verse eight, Jesus, he's gathered his disciples and he's giving them his final words. This is known as the Great Commission. We see at the end of Matthew and the Gospels and the early part of Acts. And we see in Acts chapter one, Jesus calling his followers to this, to this thing of evangelism to being ambassadors, but he gives us an amazing promise about how we are to do it. Listen to this, Acts chapter one, verse eight. He says, you will receive, everyone say power, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you will be my, here it is, witnesses. Everyone say witnesses. Telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I love that. Did you catch that? Who do we do evangelism, the sharing of the gospel, with? Not who are we evangelizing to, but who do we get to do it with? We have the help of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, no, 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 I'm going to send you out as ambassadors. I'm going to send you out to a lost, broken, and dying world who needs me. I'm calling you to be a witness, but I am not calling you to do it alone. I am going to put within you the Holy Spirit, the third part of the Trinity, and he is going to give you power, strength, ability. The, the Greek word and power is dunamis. It's, it's a dynamite, explosive, supernatural kind of power that when you go into your worlds, into your workplaces, into your homes, into your neighborhoods, that you don't go in alone as an awkward person knocking on a door, but that you go in with the ones you love, but you have someone on the inside named the Holy Spirit who strengthens you, he helps you, he gives you the words to say, he shows you what to do and when to do it, that we're not alone, but we get to do it with him. And I love this idea of being a witness, that, that, that word is so unique, and in the Greek word, it's this idea, it's this Greek word martus, and, and it's actually like a legal term. If you imagine it in a court of law, when you call a witness to the stand, what does that person do? They, they stand up and they express to the counsel, they express to the jury and to the judge their experience of the event or situation. They testify, they share, they tell the story in the court of law of how they perceive the events that happen. I love this idea, what is a witness for Jesus? It is simply someone who tells the story of what Jesus has done for them. You don't have to have all the words perfect. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to know every scripture in the Bible. What is everyday evangelism? <laughs> it means that we live every day on mission as ambassadors for Christ in our homes, our workplaces at our kid's soccer practice, when we're talking with a neighbor, and we tell the story with our lives and with our words of all we've experienced in Jesus. We tell the story of how we've been forgiven. We tell the story of the joy we found in him. We tell the story of the hope we received. We tell the story how at one point in my past I was stuck in my own sin and shame. I was broken and lost, I didn't see a way out. But then I met a man. And I can't tell you what happened. I, I don't know every detail. Like maybe someone smarter than me or more academic than me may know. But let me share my story. Let me tell you about how I was lost, but now I'm found. Let me tell you about how I was blind, but now I can see. Let me tell you about how one time I was stuck in my own way, but now I live in freedom. What does it mean to be an everyday evangelist? We're just a bunch of storytellers. Wherever a door opens, you say, hey, I'll tell my story. I don't have to preach a sermon on a stage, but I can tell my children my story. 
I don't ever have to go into the streets and get a megaphone and start screaming at the world, but I can tell my coworker my story. Church, what are we? We are everyday evangelists. We are those on mission, living as ambassadors of Christ, telling our story to the world around us. Oh, I believe as we live that way, as we understand evangelism from that perspective, no, it doesn't have to be hard or awkward at all. In fact, it can be fun. And God will meet us in that space, and I believe he'll use us as a body, not just on Sunday mornings, but everywhere we scatter during the week to bring his name everywhere we go. But here's our question, and where we'll kind of wrap up today. Like, what does that look like? (laughs) How can we learn to live as ambassadors of Christ in our everyday life? Like this week, Tuesday at 2 o'clock, when this Sunday morning experience is far from you, what does it look like to take this kind of ministry mind, this this witness mind into our world? Or with our time remaining, if I can, I just want to unpack that a little bit with us. I wanted to share two simple thoughts on what it looks like to be an everyday evangelist that I pray will help you, will encourage you um, right where you're at. And and as I do, today is what I I want us to do, everybody in the room and those watching online. I want you to think about, as I share these two, two quick thoughts, I want you to think about someone in your world, <laughs> someone you know, maybe a family member, a friend, maybe a coworker, maybe even someone that, man, I don't, never know how it will happen, but someone God's kind of put in your heart that doesn't yet know Jesus, that God might just ask you to be the one <laughs> who helps that person to encounter him. I want you to think about that individual, maybe even write their name down as I share this, because as we get to the end today, we're gonna take some time to pray for them and believe that God's gonna help them to know Jesus the same way that you've encountered him. Does that sound good? You guys ready? All right, two quick thoughts on what it means and what it looks like to be an everyday evangelist. The first thing I wanna encourage us is this. We can become everyday evangelists through our example. Say it again. We can become everyday evangelists through our example. There's a famous quote often credited to Francis of Assisi that says, Preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. I like that. I think there's no doubt that long before we say any words, the thing that often speaks the loudest is the way that we live. Ralph Waldo Emerson said it this way, What you do speaks so loudly I cannot hear what you're saying. How many of you know that one of the most important ways we communicate in life is not the messages we share, but it's the way we live? Someone once told me when I was younger, they said, Eric, everything about you says something about you. I thought, that's helpful. (laughs) Because you're always communicating about who you are, what you stand for, not with what words come out of your mouth, but with the way that you live. And I think when it comes to sharing the message of Jesus, man, this is so important for us to remember. I have a friend who was recently sharing this story with me about her upbringing. She told me the story about how her and her siblings, they all grew up in a Christian home. Uh, their mom was kind of this like faithful Christian woman and, uh, and was very strict with them. Uh, you know, she made sure they were in church every Sunday. Uh, she made sure they memorized the Bible. They weren't allowed to watch certain things on TV or listen to certain music, uh, she was, she, was, she was really strong and kind of strict in their faith. She had them in church, and in fact, she was a Sunday school teacher, she said, and would stand up every Sunday and help minister to other kids. And, and kind of from the outside looking in, their family and their mother was kind of seen as just like a, a really good Christian family, kind of traditional, doing some of the right things, the things maybe people think you're supposed to do. But, but what people didn't know or see was how her mom acted at home. You see, our friend told us that, at home, her, her mom was really mean. She was intense. She, she was full of anger and, and rage, and, and she wasn't loving. She wasn't gracious. In fact, this, this friend told us it was, just, it was even hard for her as a child to be around her mother at home. And, and so as you can imagine, her children were all left confused. What was Jesus like? Was he like who they heard about from their mom on Sunday? or who they experienced from their mom at home. Well, how many of you know that my friend and her siblings, that that it wasn't what her mom said that made the biggest impact, but it was the example that her mom set that did. 2 Corinthians 3.2 reminds us, it says this, it says, your lives are a letter 
written in our hearts. Another translation says your lives are a living letter. Everyone can read it and recognize our good work among you. Church, can I remind us that our lives, our very lives, the way we live, the example we set, it is a living letter that can be read by all. And often the words that come out of our mouth, they may be heard, but the way we live is what's gonna often be heard the loudest. The character we live with, the attitude we carry, the integrity we have, the way we raise our children, the love we extend to others, the posts we share on social media, the things we choose to do and not to do, hear this, it all preaches without saying a word. And I think we can all agree that even in the scale of our homes is where it often preaches the loudest. So here's a question to consider. If your life was a letter, what would the message be? Is the way that you are living, the example that you are setting, revealing to others the beauty of Jesus? Or is it repelling others from following in his way? I find it interesting how Jesus encouraged us with this idea of being a witness. How does the world come to understand that we're his? You remember it in John chapter 13. I love this. This is one of the ways Jesus says we can be a witness. He says, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I love that. Jesus is saying one of the ways that the world, those who don't know him, will recognize that we are part of the Jesus way, that we're one of his, that, 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 that we follow him, that it's not often in the things we say. It's not just in the doctrine we hold or the morals we have or even the sermons we preach, but people will know we're his by the example we set. It's how we love each other. That's how the world will know we're his. Again, the example of our lives can make an impact so much bigger than we could think or imagine. Matthew chapter five says, you are the light of the world, a town built on a hill that cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. How can we be everyday evangelists? Well, I think it starts by allowing our lives and our example to reflect God's word and his ways. I think we can do this by choosing to live passionately for Jesus even when others do not. By choosing to maintain godly character and integrity even when it would be easier to not. I think we can do it by being faithful, consistent, constant, steadfast and committed to our families, to our children, to our marriages and responsibilities. I think we can do so by authentically loving Jesus with pure and honest hearts, not putting on a facade of perfection, but pursuing him with all that we are. Listen, this is not about putting on a show. This is not about a performance-based Christianity. This is not about faking it and trying to present something that's inauthentic to ourselves, but it is truly living integrated lives that we don't say we're followers of Christ with our lips, but live far from it in our everyday, but that we would allow our lives to preach first, that the way we live, the example we set, the way that we love, the character we have, the, 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 the honorable nature in which we interact in business and with those in our world, that it be those things about our lives that preach the loudest and that our words would follow. I was reminded when I was younger, um, I loved playing basketball, and, and some of you guys know my story. I, I love basketball and played forever, and, and I had this tendency when I was younger playing basketball where uh, anytime I would score, I would just really want to remind and kind of let my opponent know I did. Um, <laughs> and so I, I hit a shot, I hit a three, and you know, I talked a little trash, pounded my chest, running down the court, you know, doing one of these things. And I had a big mouth. And, uh, and that got me into some trouble playing basketball. And I remember my dad uh, many times encouraged me. And I remember one time in particular, he said, hey, son. He goes, how about this? How about instead of, instead of always talking trash or making your opponent know you did a good job, how about this? What if you just let your game speak? <laughs> What if you let the way you played, how good you are, the way you, what if you let that be enough? That I don't have to say a lot. I don't have to be arrogant or cocky. I can just go out and play well. 
and that that will speak enough. And I just feel in my heart a word for our church that for some of us, maybe for some of us, we, we gotta stop talking a little bit and we gotta let our game speak. That there's been a level of inconsistency in our lives that, that we're saying one thing but have not had the character to back it up. <laughs> So we're talking over here, but our lives aren't following the example of what we're communicating about. And I wonder what it would look like if the church of Jesus was more committed rather than making my point or proving my moral values or telling you what politician to vote for, if instead what, 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 what my thing was, was that my game spoke, how I lived, the way I did things, the, the, you know, all, all of that, that my game would speak. And I believe as it does, people will see it. I just felt as I was writing this message, I just felt in my heart to encourage, and I just felt in particular some moms in the room that you want your kids to come back to Christ so badly. Maybe some of them have wandered away. And we've been doing a lot of talking to them and trying to remind them and, and tell them, and that's all good. The heart is so right. But maybe sometimes what people in our world need is just to see the example of a follower of Jesus over time, be faithful, steadfast, and committed. And then when the time is right, when the time's right, and the example's been set, then there'll be opportunity to speak some words. So, number one, how do we be everyday evangelists? I think we can do so through our example, through our example. But I want to encourage you with this one, because to me, they're two sides of the same coin. The second thing, and we'll close right here, Julie, if you want to come play, would be great. I want to encourage us that we can become everyday evangelists through our words, through our words. Romans chapter 10, let me just remind us of what this says. Um, we read it earlier. It says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can anyone call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Here's the deal. While it's true that we ought to allow our lives to preach the gospel, that, that we can preach the gospel with our example, that, that our lives, they are a living letter to be read by all. I want to remind us this morning that we must also share the message of Jesus with our words. <laughs> I want us to get this. It's the example of our lives that gives us the credibility needed for our words to be weighty. It's the example of our lives that opens the door of opportunity to share the gospel with our words. But listen, there comes a point in evangelism where we must use our words. We must tell people, those we love, those we know, about the truth of salvation in Jesus. Yes, we must live it, but we also must communicate it. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Your heart should be holy and set apart for the Lord God. Always be ready to tell everyone who asks you why you believe as you do. Be gentle as you speak and show respect. My wife has this great story about sharing her faith when she was a young Christian in high school uh, that I think might be a story we can all relate with. You see, Alexa was um, in high school working at Menards. Come on, Menards get the deals. Um, and Alexa was a cashier in early, early days of high school, and she had just kind of gotten her heart set on fire for God. Uh, she was hungry for the Lord. She was learning, and uh, man, she had a heart to reach the world, and in particular, God had put a, this thing in her heart to reach her coworkers, <laughs> to help those that she worked with to know Christ. Many of them didn't, and, uh, and so she was praying about that. She was seeking the Lord, and, and if you know my wife, um, she just like smiles all the time, all right? She's like one of the happiest people I've ever met. She's got this like big, wide, toothy smile, and, and I love it. And she's kind of always been that way. When she was in high school working at Menards, people kind of noticed this joy that she lived with. And, and one day, she was standing with all of her coworkers when her boss randomly goes, Alexa, why are you always so joyful? What's going on? Is it, is it because of this Jesus guy you follow? So here Alexa is in this like moment. One she's prayed for, but as you can imagine, like being young, you're just learning and, and kind of, she just felt this fear grip her heart, kind of just trembling and, and, and she wanted to say something else, but all, 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 all she could say was, oh no, I just, I'm just a happy person. I've kind of always been that way. And the moment just went on. Well, that night as she was driving home from work, she just was gutted. <laughs> she felt ashamed, felt embarrassed, felt sad, like she just, she wanted them to know Christ and, 
and felt like she missed a chance. And with tears in her eyes, she prayed what I think is a really bold prayer. She said, Father, give me another chance. God, give me another chance. I don't want to just have my example show you. I want to tell them about you. Well, the next morning she drove back to work and how many of you know, when you pray a prayer like that, God will always come through. You ask God for a chance to share the gospel, it will be given to you. Well, that next day at work, she was working and she was talking to a coworker and sure enough, this coworker just started kind of opening her heart about what she'd been going through, some challenges she was facing, she was crying, she, she had no hope, she didn't know what to do and, and Alexa, hey, this is my moment. And so rather than just being Miss Smiles, who was a happy girl, who was positive, no, 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 now it was time to share Jesus. And so she did, and she started to tell this girl her story of how she met Jesus, and Jesus changed her life, and that there's hope in him, and, and you're not stuck where you are, and began to share the gospel with her. And she prayed with this coworker right there at Menards, and she invited the coworker to church, and for the first time in Alexa's kind of like young Christian journey, she had the chance to be used of God to tell someone else about the good news that's found in Christ. Why do I share this story? I, I think because honestly, it's a great picture of the real, the, the messy, the sometimes scary journey of opening our mouths to tell someone about Jesus. I understand we all deal with fear. <laughs> sometimes we feel like we don't have the right words to say. Other times we, we feel we're nervous about what someone would think of us, but here's the deal. If all we ever do is be an example for Christ, but we never open our mouths to tell others about the salvation and hope we found in Christ, then we leave people without the handles they need to actually be able to find salvation in Jesus for themselves. We must, we must, we must use our words to proclaim the gospel. And in a world that is so culturally sensitive, oh, I understand there's fear and pressure, it's very real to be canceled, kicked out of our job in, in, in a world that, that wants to shut out religion. Can I remind the church of Jesus that we have always been built on those who are unashamed of the gospel and put their lives even on the line to tell someone else about the good news of Jesus. Church, I want to encourage us. I want to spark a fire in our hearts today for evangelism. It is not someone else's job, it's all of our jobs. There are people in your homes, in your families, in your neighborhoods you work with that God has put you there, not just to make an income, not just to live it, he's put you there on purpose to tell them about Jesus. So this message almost has two parts today. Some of us, I think we can be quick to wanna to tell everybody else what we think, how they should live, quick to quote scripture, but man, our, our lives don't have the character to back it up. My encouragement for you today as men, let's first, let's be an example of what it looks like to follow Jesus. Let's let our example in our lives preach, and then let's let our words follow. But for others of us, and I think it's many, we love saying amen to be an example for Jesus. We love that quote. Yeah, yeah, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. Meaning, I don't have to use words. That's not what I'm saying. I want to encourage you, it's time to get out of your bubble of comfortability. It's time to put yourself kind of a little bit further out than you've been used to. It's time to pray. Say, God, open up an intimate conversation with my son. God, help me get into a position, God, with, with, with my neighbor where, where we can connect. But God, give me the courage to tell them my story, <laughs> to tell them a little bit about Jesus. For some of us, it's time to use our words. No matter where you are today, I want to remind us that we are a church that is built on evangelism, <laughs> community, and discipleship. We must refuse the spirit of religion that wants to make Christianity an us for no more journey. It's about deeper worship, longer prayer, cuter Bible studies. Forget the world, they're all going to hell anyway. Let's just make sure our Christianity is padded and comfortable. We must refuse that. And we must go on mission like Christ to seek and save the lost. We must be those who know that winning souls is wise and who don't live so our faith is easier for us but who lives sacrificially. Who lives sacrificially that the lost world that doesn't know Jesus yet, that we'd be a rescue team to go help them. That is our spirit. And as we close today, I wanna pray to that end. I asked you a little bit earlier to put someone in your heart or mind 
someone in your world, in your life. I mean, that God wants to use you. He wants to use you with power to help them to know Jesus. As we close today, I want to pray for two things. First, I want to pray for this. I want to pray for them. And I want to believe that even this week, God would open some door of opportunity for you to walk into you to tell your story, to tell them about what Jesus has done for you. And that in that space, God would use us as a church to change the world. Why don't we all stand to our feet? I want you to put that person in your mind. In fact, why don't we all lift our hands to heaven? I want to bring that person before the Lord. Let's pray for them today like someone once prayed for you. I want to pray for courage for you this week, this month, this summer. And this will be a summer that not only changes your life, but changes the lives of those around you. Father, right now I pray for your church. I thank you, Father God, for each person in this room that's watching online. I thank you for each name of each individual in our hearts and minds right now. Why don't you with your mouth, open your mouth, talk to God about it. Bring their name before God right now. Let's, 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 let's lift them up. Father, we pray for them. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to give us wisdom, to give us open doors of opportunity to be used of you to share the gospel. I pray that our lives and our words would have an anointing upon them to help those around us to see Jesus in ways they never have. I pray for great courage and boldness that we would not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but we would be reminded it is the power of God for salvation. I thank you in Jesus' name, Lord, for just open doors this week, for intimate conversations, for heartfelt connections, for opportunities opportunities we could never do ourselves to bring the message of Jesus to those that we love. I thank you for lives being changed and a church that's empowered to become the bride you've called us to be. We pray for those people here and now. Again, why don't you just do it by name. Father, I pray for our neighbors. I thank you in Jesus' name for an open door. I thank you at the right time we would take advantage of every opportunity and we would be bold to talk about you, Jesus. Thank you for your help. We are everyday evangelists in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. I can't wait to hear the stories of what God does. <laughs> Lastly, we're gonna pray one final prayer and then our team's gonna sing just one, one, one more worship song to seal the word in our hearts today. But if you're here today, what a great Sunday to come to church. <laughs> if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, if you've never walked with him, or maybe you have in your past, but you've walked away, you've come today and, and you don't have a current relationship with Christ. As we close service this morning, I would love to pray with you and for you. The Bible says today is the day of salvation, and in just a moment, we're going to pray a prayer of salvation, asking Jesus to be the Lord of our lives, asking Him to forgive our sins, to reconcile us back with the one who created us, to give us hope for our future in heaven. And if you've never prayed a prayer like that, if you're watching online, and as we close today, I want to pray, and all of us are going to pray together, but I want to include you in that prayer. I believe for somebody in the room, today's your day to become a follower of Jesus. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, all across the room, if that's you, I don't want to embarrass you. It's a moment between you and God, but I would love to know who we're praying for. If that's you all across the room, those online, would you just lift your hand to heaven right now? Say, Eric, that's me. Today, I'm going to make a decision. I want to be a follower of Jesus. I've been running. I've been doing life my own way, but I hear God knocking on my heart today. And it's time to surrender. It's time to follow him in his ways. All across the room, I see a few hands going up. We just give it a moment longer. Oh, I love seeing it. God moving and speaking to people. Come on, church. Can we all pray this prayer out loud together? Let's join those with their hands raised. Let's all say, dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying in my place. Right now, I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. From this day forward, I choose to follow you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.